Great. Um, welcome to those of us joining online and to our small audience. Um, we are coming to you live, I feel like a television broadcaster, um, live from UBC uh, this morning and we're going to talk about audiovisual records in a digital age. Uh, my name is Lisa Glent and I'm the Education and Advisory Services Coordinator for the uh, AABC. And I'm pleased to be here with uh, a table of um, speakers today who have experience working with uh, audiovisual records in their holdings and they're going to share um, share that background and that experience with you. As a start today, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people, and that we are uh, here today in partnership with uh, UBC Irving Barber K Learning Center. So thank you uh, for UBC for hosting us today, and for Mark, our fabulous technician in the back, keeping the live stream going. Um, a couple of housekeeping things uh, before we start. Um, if you have any questions for those following online, you can um, email us at aabc.advisor at aabc.ca or on Twitter at hashtag aabcav. Thank you. Um, and Alexandra here uh, will happily uh, represent you in the conversation and share any questions or comments you might have. Uh, and for those in our, our small but loyal audience, um, you guys are also welcome to uh, use the microphone to ask uh, questions throughout our discussion today. Um, so it's kind of always a timely thing to talk about audiovisual records and digitization. Um, they're sort of one of the, the most sort of treasured things in our holdings, but the things that kind of give us the greatest amount of grief and headache because um, I'm pretty sure not a lot of us have beta machines and pneumatic players to look at those treasures we have, or you open a can of, um, uh, of a film and it's just falling apart and the gases are coming out. So um, it's part of our job is to provide access to these materials, but how do we preserve them so that we can provide access going forward? And I think as with, you guys can probably attest to it, that you know photographs in our collections are something that really evoke a strong historical passion for people, but there's something about when you can see and hear that history coming alive through these audiovisual records um, that is really uh, an important part of connecting people to their history. Um, and that's what becomes a difficult part for us, is how do we preserve that and keep the integrity of those records. Um, so that's a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Um, our webcast is going to run for about an hour. so. Um, keep with us today or you can follow us again online when we um, have the links put up in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, but to start, um, let's have our panel uh, introduce themselves and we'll jump into our conversation. So, let's start with you. Hi, I'm Alexandra Wieland. I am the Privacy Officer at Simon Fraser University and I'm here because I am on the executive of the AABC. And you're my wingman today. And I am Mrs. Wingman. <laughs> So please, if you have any questions, tweet them. It's AABCAV, um, or the email address again was aabc.advisor at aabc.ca. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I'm Ember Lundgren, and I'm the preservation manager for the Royal BC Museum and uh, BC Archives in Victoria. And I'm Karen Knights. I'm the manager of the Krista Dahl Media Library and Archive at Vivo Media Arts Centre in Vancouver. I'm Jana Graisley. I'm a digital archivist at the City of Vancouver Archives, um, but that's really just my title. I do many, many things, including um, dealing a lot with audiovisual stuff. My name is Christy Waller, and I'm the archivist at Western Front Media Arts. Um, it's an artist-run center that was founded in 1973, and our archive consists mostly of audiovisual materials. My name is Shyla Seller, and I have two contract positions right now, one with the Vancouver Holocaust Education Center, who has a lot of um, pneumatic tapes, and one, and my other job is with SFU Archives, where I'm doing digitization work on their audiovisual records. Great. Um, I was really happy to put together this panel because you guys represent sort of very traditional archives, um, but also um, some very different archival or some organizations with uh, archival holdings. And so I thought sort of bringing together those different experiences and the backgrounds and the types of records you have while they're sort of united, but sort of coming at them from different access and preservation needs um, would sort of help with a, a well-rounded conversation this morning. Um, so really maybe just jumping in, if I can, 
I, I told you there was no hot seat, but you're beside me. Um, <laughs> if you don't mind, Amber, um, you're with uh, the Royal BC Museum and Archives, um, which most of us know is in Victoria. Um, what kind of audiovisual records do you guys have there? Maybe that's sort of how we'll jump the conversation of, you know, what kind of records do you have in sort of that AV sphere? Um, how do you provide access to those materials? And what are some of the preservation needs, your, the issues that you're dealing with right now? Well, we've got um, a lot of audiovisual materials, both government and private records. Uh, we've got motion picture film, about 5,000 or more holdings, and some of which are um, uh, the complete works of a particular artist. Uh, we've also got government films uh, for tourism or any sort of well, propaganda, you know, government mm -hmm. initiatives that were uh, done. So we have all of those. And we also have umatic tapes. A large portion of our collection are umatic as well as Betacam SP. Uh, we have two inch, one inch, half inch open reel video as well as uh, a lot of open reel to reel audio, cassette audio. We've got um, sound discs. We've got several thousand almost 10,000 sound discs. Uh, we also have, um, we've got wax recordings and wire recordings. Uh, so we've got pretty much a representation of almost anything that's ever been decided to be created on either magnetic media or, or film. We've got everything you can imagine and, and lots of it. <laughs> <laughs> Is it just you, or please tell me you have a little team? I have, I have a team, <laughs> but a um, you know we're responsible for um, the care and collection care of the archives uh, portion mm -hmm. mainly. Uh, but because of the audio and video um, being a kind of a, a difficult thing for a lot of people to manage, there are little little pieces of those things in the museum collections as well. So we're here also to preserve those pieces, mm -hmm. even though there's collection managers who who handle all of their collections, if there's audio recordings of bird calls or something, then, you know, we assist with those sorts of things. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and how, how is it in terms of access with people coming in? Is it preferred that, you know, you need to have an appointment because obviously you're dealing with, you know, playback equipment or maybe even the fact that you can't provide access to some types of of records that people are looking for? Yep, uh, you're absolutely right. We can't uh, provide access to a lot of things. For instance, our motion picture film is all frozen um, as a preservation um, measure until such time as we can, you know, have the funds and uh, the ability to actually digitize or copy them into mm -hmm. to access. Uh, most of our videos, we have a legacy of VHS reference copies, so people can come into the reference room and still see many of the films mm -hmm. that have been transferred. Um, we generally try and make access available uh, as much as possible, which sometimes means uh, pulling our video collections out of cool storage. We actually moved all of our original recordings that we knew of. There is backlogs, of course, that will surprise us, but um, everything was moved into cool storage, so around 5 to 6 degrees Celsius and a humidity between 30 and 40 RH just to prolong the life of mm -hmm. those things. So. Some things are more difficult to give access to, um, but we're lucky because past uh, preservation measures, and when I say past, I mean the 70s and the 80s, is they really tried to make master copies of the really important things or the things they knew people would want, so we can still provide access that way. Okay. Yeah. And those master copies, I guess, now are oh, you know, yeah. 30 to 40 years old, yes. so their their quality and condition is, is now may probably coming into play a little bit of... Yes, you know. it's uh, we've pulled some off of the shelves because we didn't have room in cold storage to put yeah. the masters in. We just had to do the originals, and we can't play the masters. Uh, but we've been pretty lucky that anything we've pulled out of cool storage and, and um, you know, had baked that we've been able to get something. So, like, we've been quite, quite lucky. <laughs> Great. Good. Thank you. And for you guys. Yeah, so Vivo actually started as the video in, and we started as a video library, mm -hmm. an exchange library that was um, trying to facilitate the international exchange of video. So, like sort of a blockbuster for the counterculture, essentially. <laughs> and and um, un, like, very similar to Western Front, same time period, 1973, when we first started. Um, so our primary concern, we do have audio, we have audio recordings, we have some film that have come in with various mm -hmm. personal archives that have come into the space, um, and we have photographic material. But our primary concern is around our video collection. Um, that dates back to the late 60s and all the way through on 
virtually any format that you can imagine, the material has come into the space. So right now we have about 7,300 individual titles and um, about 20% of that has been digitized so far. Um, the rest, we have other activities that we now take on mm -hmm. and our primary purpose is to support media artists working today. So we have um, uh, educational programs, we do tech rentals, we do facility, mm -hmm. um, low-cost facility access, uh, and international distribution and exhibitions. Um, so just to put that in context, the archive now is what the library used to be and is now growing more as an archive as we're bringing in new acquisitions that are pr primarily around personal archives and archives of defunct uh, media organizations or community cable oh, material. Okay. Um, so the, we have very limited funding and limited staff in terms of what we can do there. What we're able to do is we have a, um, uh, a, a technician there who can digitize material that has um, been made possible through our distribution wing that does get funding so it supports our digitization hub. Um, so we're working on trying to um, deal with our backlog of digitization now. Mm -hmm. So. The, the majority of the work is produced either by, it, it's, we have a mixed um, archive uh, because it represents the trajectory of independent media pr or video production in, in Canada, which was both production by artists, experimentation by artists, but also um, communities using video, portable video, to document their movements and their issues. So we have a, a split and we actually had a mandated split for the 70s and 80s mm -hmm. where we had to have 50% in the collection that were around social issues and half art. So it has a very different sort of texture than a lot of yeah. current media art collections. And do you, do you provide access to that sort of archival material or because now yeah. uh, you're sort of doing this dual stream of, of sort of, you yeah. know, this... Yeah, what we're trying to do is community. we've been able to get a few grants through Irving K's BC yeah. History Digitization uh, grant program uh, around the materials related to BC History, so around the Community Cable um, Project Gable Vision, which was one of the first LGBTQ uh, television shows in Canada and we just completed the Gay Games uh, Celebration 90 which happened in Vancouver. We have complete raw footage of that Great. which we've done and we've put that all online and freely accessible. Um, thanks to those grants, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, copyright issues are a big deal for us. In terms of viewing in-house, um, all the material that comes in can be viewed in-house. We're doing the same thing. We're providing access to our DVD copies that we have. <laughs> So that's sort of fun. It's like people see that. It's retro. Like it's great having young people come in. You can it's retro. So, um, we have we have like 800 or so DVDs that are accessible now, which gives a broad uh, overview of the collection. They're some of the most popular tapes. That's just the way it's yeah. it's happened. We do um, digitization on request for researchers. We do. Um, digitization for the ongoing work of video distribution. Mm -hmm. okay. So that, that's how we're, we're provide in-house access by appointment usually and we've just started a series of volunteers that include some of our first generation inners as we call them um, are now uh, running Sunday openings when, they, when it's possible. So we're sort of doing, they've done four in the last month but it'll probably be more like two a month so people can come in and view whatever Great. is nice. available to them. It's, it's almost like it's, it's great to advertise that you have this done, but then you're, it's, it's being wary and being prepared for the flood of yeah. what could come out from that, whether uh, people doing research or just general interest in that mm -hmm. topic that you're like, oh, we want attention, but maybe in a slow, moderated <laughs> way to prepare for the attention that we might get. Yeah. Um, no, that's great. Thank you. Good. Hi. Um, so at the City of Vancouver Archives, we're obviously the repository for the business records of the city. Um, so about half of our holdings are city government records and the other half are private donations. So um, we get audiovisual stuff both from the city and from private donations. Um, similar to BC Archives and, and also to Vivo, it runs the gamut in terms of format. Um, we've got nitrate film all the way up to born digital video actually. And right now, one of the things that I'm working on is a project involving like 12 one terabyte hard drives that have about 5,000 video files each on them. Wow. Uh, born digital video, so that's the full stretch. Um, 
In terms of access, we're, um, and digitization, we're lucky enough to have a kind of modest budget for digitization. Um, so we've been able to keep up with motion picture film, getting that done as we get it in, basically. Mm -hmm. We have an annual shipment. Um, we don't digitize film in-house. We've got a third-party vendor. Um, but yeah, so we're lucky enough to kind of not really have a film backlog, which is great. Um, in terms of video and audio, we have um, some playback machines. So we've got pneumatic decks, we've got um, VHS, and obviously we've got um, DV and mini DV as well. I say obviously just because it's a little <laughs> yeah. bit more, you know, if you have something, often you have that. Um, so we've got that. Um, and we also do have a digitization set up for audio, but we haven't been capturing audio in-house for a while, mm -hmm. um, in part due to, like, lack of personnel. So even if you, you build it, yeah. you still need the, the humans to, to do it. To and do so them. that's an issue for us, for sure. Um, we have an online database, searcharchives.vancouver.ca. Um, <laughs> You're our, totally allowed to plug your own organization. Yeah. <laughs> it's free PR. I'm OK with that. Um, and we make everything that's digitized available that way, um, including things actually that are under third party copyright, because now within Atom, we use Atom. Um, and with Adam, within Atom now, there's uh, click through basically, so things that are available under third party copyright, the user can agree that they're viewing those things for fair dealing purposes. Um, so we make everything available that way. Um, we don't provide access to the tapes themselves. So if we do have things that are in the backlog that haven't been digitized yet, and somebody wants to see them, really at this point it just means that they move up the queue in terms of getting in on the next shipment. Um, we do try to keep up as things come in with, with all the visual stuff. With mm -hmm. audio, there's definitely some backlog. Um, and one of the issues actually that is related to kind of moving forward with that is actually appraisal. Is oh, yeah. when will somebody be able to sit down with the shooter and crank through all these things? Because some of them come from um, public record series, from city series. Yeah. And we just don't, you know, they, they come in a transfer and you don't actually know necessarily you can't sometimes you don't know what's on there and it's the fine balance of knowing yeah. that, that there's actual staff time to sit and do it and you're like mm -hmm. oh, I just watched this and it's like 45 minutes of not really very useful archival something to keep mm -hmm. that we would have appraised yeah how, how much can you yeah. trust what's written on the on the case yeah um, compared to what it actually is when you when you look at it or listen to it and the fact that that has to kind of happen in real time mm -hmm. um, so that's an issue for sure okay thank yeah. you um, I should have mentioned I also work part-time at the city, so I do some item level description of AV materials there as well. Um, and then at Western Front, we have about 1,600 videotapes and about 400 audio tapes, all from documentation or productions that happened at Western Front. So um, we have researchers coming in, academics, artists, artists and residents creating new works and looking at archival materials from Western Front, um, and then also curators. Um, and we have been able to set up a digitization workstation for both the audio and the video. And kind of like Vivo, one of the great things about being kind of in the media arts scene very early was that we have a lot of that equipment from when the pieces were created. So um, having to start a digitization workstation from scratch now would be very difficult without that legacy um, equipment. So we're really lucky in that sense. Although one thing I did want to mention was that just maintaining that equipment is really challenging. Um, and sometimes, you know, we can play the tapes, like the tapes will be fine, but the decks just can't handle it. Or like we've played the half inch, uh, especially half inch open reel video has been a real problem lately. Um, there's not really any heads, there's no alignment tapes, there's no one that can fix them. So this is like a huge that Karen and I have talked about recently. And yeah, so that's kind of one big thing. Um, but we are able to digitize and largely due to grants as well, Irving K. Barber and the uh, Library and Archives Canada um, grant, the Community Projects Grant, um, and so we've done our literary collection, and right now we're about to launch the Women in Performance Art Collection, so that'll be coming out next week, hopefully, so stay tuned. <laughs> um, but uh, at, like Vivo, copyright is a huge issue, and Western Front um, produced a lot of the documentation, so it's kind of like a shared copyright, where the artist has the copyright for the actual performance, but we have it for the video, so we always ask the artist before we post anything. Um, and sometimes people don't want it up, and that's that's a tricky thing with with grants that require access, public access. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you, Shyla. 
Um, so the VHEC has a large collection of Holocaust testimony uh, recordings that were done mostly on Umatic and DV and Beta, and uh, they have some audio um, formats as well. And those have mostly been uh, digitized, and we did that out in house um, with Flu Media in Toronto. Sorry. And uh, so I kind of managed that process by doing quality checks of, of digital formats as they came back. and. Um, and ingested them into our digital preservation system, which is an LTO deck, basically, and then a database that gathers metadata. Um, and at, so that that's a that thing about the VHEC Holocaust testimony um, project is that's ongoing, and right now, uh, born digital video is being produced in high definition and really mm -hmm. gigantic files, and that's um, something that we haven't really gotten a chance to figure out how to properly digitally preserve yet, so that's, an, that's um, kind of what we're working on now, mostly there. And at SFU, um, they were really lucky at, to get a large donation of equipment from SFU Creative Services, who created a lot of these videos that are um, in SFU's collection, so I guess their videos are pretty, and they have a lot of film too, and, and a bunch of different formats, but they have a lot of recordings of things like convocation or um, old Webster interviews with Gordon Shrum or um, football games by SFU football teams or basketball teams. Um, and some of my favorites that I've been working on lately are uh, a lot of early dance performances put on by the School for Contemporary Arts that, that are, um, that, uh, and they recorded all their, their productions, their student and faculty productions from the 70s and 80s and 90s, and they're really beautiful to watch. So doing work on those. Um, but they were, you're, like as Christy was saying, the difficulty of building these digitization um, systems and accessing decks is really hard unless you are kind of lucky enough to have them, have the decks that were used to, to create these, which we were luckily given a giant stack of. Um, but I do have some formats that I can't access. Like I just discovered some, this format called ED beta in our collection, which um, is super rare and no one converts it, and it's enhanced definition beta, which you can't play on, on a typical beta deck. Um, so it's truly archival now. It's really, <laughs> I don't know it's how to handle archival. it. archival. Yeah, it's a really um, it's, one. <laughs> I was at a, um, a CCI workshop last year, and we were talking about um, modern, it was the modern information carriers, and uh, our instructor, um, uh, Joe Arachi, made the comment, well, once you digitize something, why do you have to worry about keeping the original carrier? And I was like, oh. <laughs> like I did the collective gasp for like the class of 30 of us, because I was like, how dare you say that to a group of archivists? Like, that's what we do, we keep the old stuff. But then I was like, actually, it kind of makes sense, because, and I, I kind of wanted to pose that question, I don't know if, if you agree, it, it, it's an interesting thing to think about, because, you know, is it is it the the, the physical carrier, like we were attached to this film reel on this the 16 millimeter film, or is it the information and the content that's on it? Yes, that's the archival information per se. Um, but it was an interesting thing, and, and I think most of the class of that workshop was just like, I can't believe you just said that. But I was like, that's a it's a fair comment to look at it. Like you know, you you created this new, uh, you've migrated the copy, you've got this this digital version now. Why do we have to worry about the time and effort and trying to track down equipment to play the originals if we've now created this sort of more modern, more usable uh, copy? But it was just a bit of an interesting thought. I was like, oh, I have to remember to ask that question at some point. And today was like a good point to ask the question to you guys if there was, if, if you would, that but I don't know, if you want to say that, it would make you lose your job or not, so I don't know. <laughs> I sort of feel like that assumes then that the digital copy is somehow secure yeah mm -hmm. and yeah. Uh, that's not necessarily true for a whole variety of reasons including just the format that was used uh, are we going to be able to transfer all that material to the next format it keeps going on and on but um for an organization like vivo that um we're really lucky this year we got a bcac early career development grant so we were able to hire uh sophie robert a slace graduate to come in and, and work on our digital assets this year, which was fantastic. But for the most part, we deal with amateur archivists who probably are artists who have dealt with archival practices within their own art form and then are translating it to um, uh, the work that we have. Um, 
we, I don't feel our system of um, digital uh, preservation is robust enough yet. Yeah. And, and I, uh, until I can be guaranteed that we have enough backups, enough ability to um, securely deal with the collection as a whole, I, I like keeping the originals. We've several times been in a position where for one reason or another data was lost and we had to go back to the original. So yeah. I'm all in favor of saving originals. Yeah, I sort of agree with the, the lack of trust of the sort of infrastructure, I think, is and, and the preservation. Because, you know, if you have a really robust system where you're doing all the checksums and the migrations and things and that's happening, um, you can feel sort of confident about those digital files. But when you're doing passive preservation, mm -hmm. which is what most of us do, which mm -hmm. is, you know, you're saving the files, the high resolution ones, mm -hmm. you're making your access copies and you're backing it up, but you're really not doing full uh, preservation actions like in, for born digital. You mm -hmm. want to put any magnetic media that goes onto digital, you want it to be treated like a born digital object because it has become the original because mm -hmm. you know you can't go back to the, the tapes. Some, are, uh, some tapes are better than others. Like if, if you transfer a umatic, you know you can't replay that umatic. It's very rare, especially if it's particularly sticky and horrible. And so I think part of it is just that, that worry. I mean, we've had things that we can't get back even though we needed yeah. to try again. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's just the nature of, of, our, our, of who we are in an archive or you know a collection like that and just that safety net and you know with with us is a lot of um, original videos in the past were, were destroyed or put aside because they had moved it onto something better umatic mm -hmm. you know <laughs> yeah. like and, the and, of the future and, VHS. and VHS right <laughs> and you know and they were working within um, their best best practice at the time their knowledge um, you know the resources they had and you know you can't project into the future uh, for for video and, and what you're transferring things to I'm just pleased that the motion picture film people understand like you can as long as you have a light source you can pretty much see motion picture yeah. or photographs and so people get the that you can return to those things whereas Magnetic media is really once you've sort of baked it that second time, you you really can't Whatever get it you back. Is what you yeah, yeah, and you just have to try and do do the best. But yeah, we're even nervous about you know we have the Webster collection and it's 2,500 umatic tapes, um, you know, and we've done about 1,100 of the tapes. We've done about 800 episodes. Um, and we still have these boxes of these originals and, and we still have to come to an agreement and that trust of getting rid of them. And we know that they're probably not able to, to get another copy off of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've got a question from Twitter for the panel um, and it's around ingesting into digital preservation systems and we've <laughs> alluded to that. Um, the question is, are there any good on-premise non-cloud-based software systems that you could recommend specifically for a small local archives or for a local First Nations archives. Um, how difficult is it to set up and use? Mm. Somebody want to jump in? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we all look at you. Uh, cool. I mean, actually, and I should also say that Jana and Shiloh have also worked at Western French um, <laughs> and so have some experience using the system as well. And Jana was one of the people that created it, so she might be able to speak to it as well. But uh, we have an LTO5 deck. And um, something that we do is when we are describing a tape um, and we digitize it, we, we write all the metadata into a FileMaker database. We export that metadata um, both about the capture process and about the digital object itself and about the physical object um, into an XML file. And then we write that into a folder with the actual master copy of the video. And we write that file onto LTO. So an LTO, it can hold about 1.5 terabytes, LTO 5. I think we're up to LTO 8 now, and it holds 12 terabytes. It's like crazy. So, um, And they are only two generations backwards compatible. And it is also a magnetic tape. So it seems kind of funny to be you know, digitizing <laughs> and then writing back to an LTO tape. But the thing about the LTO tape for a small organization is that, as I said, I work part time. Most of my um, wage is grant, grant based. So there is a point in time where I may not be able to be there and there may be nobody in my position. So having those tapes sitting there when they have a lifespan of, um, they say, 30 years, 
um, as long as you have the playback equipment. I mean, there's lots of things, mm -hmm. and I don't think that any system is totally ideal, but, you know, really, if they sat there for five years and the LTO deck was still there, we would still be able to get the content off, ideally. And we write two copies, so hopefully on one of them. Plus, we mm -hmm. also have access copies, but, but the master uncompressed copies are there. So we do, it's kind of like an, a manual OAIS-inspired <laughs> um, <laughs> digital preservation system. It's time-consuming. Um, you know, if I'm going to sit down and write a couple tapes and do all the prep and write the folders and everything, it takes about a day to do a tape, and then four hours to write the tape, each tape. So um, it is, it's a long process, and you've also and had experience. And those decks are very expensive, and they're really so it's really expensive. hard yeah. for smaller organizations to sort of fundraise Yeah, to although them. equipment grants are easier to get than archive grants. So if yes. you can somehow mm -hmm. swing it, so it's are more there, about the equipment. Are there places for equipment grants? Like what organizations? I can't remember. This I wasn't the there when head, Western Front kind of, bought it. I actually wasn't either. Um, we got our LTO through um, uh, BC Arts Council. Oh, okay. In a, mm -hmm. in a um, oh, I'm trying to remember what the specific grant was, but it was one of the infrastructure-based grants. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we were, we were able to do a bit of an upgrade at that point. Okay. But you can't count on being able to constantly go back to the same source. Yeah. Yeah, right. that's so, the thing. Yeah. Okay, it's good to know. And they're so expensive, they're hard for us to fit into our regular equipment grants that we get through Canada Council. It's just not going to... Yeah. Go um, if I can just jump in. Yeah. Um, regarding smaller organizations, I think that one thing that... Um, makes the entire prospect of digital preservation really intimidating for small organizations is that a lot of the resources and information that are out there are, um, they either come out of large projects at large institutions with like often say institutions in the States or in Europe that have actually like quite like either private philanthropic or government funding behind them. Um, and so sometimes the scale doesn't really map yeah, to what smaller organizations are, small are organization. doing. Yeah. And so you feel like even just the like the barrier to entry just feels like enormous. Um, I think that like from my experience at Western Front, kind of developing a digital preservation system, which is very manual, um, really in a lot of ways for me, that was actually kind of my gateway to starting to feel comfortable dealing with digital preservation at all mm -hmm. um, certainly isn't part of my background prior to becoming an archivist and um, it's entirely possible in a small organization to just like if you have a relatively small number of things you're actually stewarding mm -hmm. yeah it's quite manual there's sort of like there's this file I'm going to package up its metadata into a little folder and I'm going to copy it over here yeah. like it doesn't have to be a robust in just system that does everything automatically for mm -hmm. you. Like it does mean then there's a lot of human time going into that, yeah. but you also have to weigh that against the human time that would go into learning how to install and run Archivematica, which is just like not terribly accessible for people yeah. who don't have maybe a lot of technical skill or background or a lot of time or staff that are paid, all of that stuff. So yeah. it's going to be, um, it's going to be a resource intensive undertaking no matter what you do, um, but it's entirely possible to just scale it way, way, way back. And um, maybe too, yeah, to build that confidence in doing it a small project where you're not saying, I'm gonna yeah. like digitize 500 things by next Tuesday, which is not gonna happen. And no, yeah. to build it into a work plan, what's that budget gonna be? Do we need to back up and look at grants and what are some resource agencies mm -hmm. I can use? Do I need to get training myself? Do I need to go in and shadow someone for like a day or two and mm -hmm. just ask all those little annoying questions that I I need answers to so I can understand what I'm talking about mm -hmm. and and sort of see how that the the, the workflow works. Um, yeah, I definitely think it's it's do yeah, so it's good to know. It's doable, mm -hmm. but there's you need a little bit of prep work and you need to sort of be realistic about what you can achieve and sort of yeah, and it. I think also that Christy makes a really good point about the continuity factor that you mm -hmm. do have to think ahead to even if I can install and run and administer this system, like is that person in that role still going to be there and what's mm -hmm. going to happen in the future? And so you also want to create something that is going to be um, easily intelligible yeah. in the future when you're not there. Procedures. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right, procedures these, yeah. are really good And to these have. become like those pet projects, right? Like you'll either have a director or a manager who's like, yes, I support the fact that like, this is the, the, your, your big project of the year is to work on the audiovisual collection. So great, you've got the time and resources to do it, but then you can have a complete shift or a donation that comes in that's a completely different sphere of work and then that just gets dropped. So exactly, mm -hmm. like the reality of the day to day, if it's just a small organization that's like one or two people, part time, grants, all those things that a lot of us um, 
have to manage. Um, the reality is you, you don't have that perfect eight hours a day, Monday to Friday, sitting there doing just that audiovisual focused work, right? So you've got to be able to know that it might be a piecemeal project. Developing the policies, like, that is like the driest part of probably what we do sitting down, this is what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. But that's what's going to create the, that good foundation to go forward so that either when you leave or you move on or someone else comes in to help work on the project, they've got that foundation to move forward on instead of going what and how and why did they do yeah. that and wasting that time and resources. Yeah, and workflow is really important. I make all of my staff who are doing digitization, whether it's scanning or whatever they're mm -hmm. scanning, is there's a procedure, there's a workflow that starts from like taking it off of the shelf and then clearing copyright or clearing rights or checking if it's restricted and then all the way through. So I think documenting what you do so future generations know what you've done or when someone comes in. Yeah. Um, is really important and um, especially with retirements and people leaving uh, yeah. but also like small organizations should befriend their IT department because a lot of this like relies on mm -hmm. IT and mm -hmm. the computer guy who comes in and helps you fix stuff and if you can explain sort of what you need they're usually really good about wanting to help try and figure that out mm -hmm. and then some of that scary technical stuff can be helped along the way by people who have more computer experience say than you may have yeah yeah um one of the things that I was, was doing and I sort of spammed various museum and library and archive listers over the past month is um, putting together just the, a resource list of mm -hmm. um, companies that do um, audiovisual um, uh, reformatting and, and preservation. Um, and so thank you for everyone that uh, has had shared companies that they've worked with and, and their uh, experiences. Um, and even just knowing that that, because people aren't even familiar with or comfortable to say, I may have this player, but how do I get it from point A to point B? C. And so, um, you know, outsourcing and having, you know, reputable companies doing that work is, is a great avenue. And then you can sort of build that into your budget, uh, you know, small scale, large scale, um, tied in with granting projects, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but you mentioned the, about doing like quality control and checking afterwards. Like that's a huge part of the workflow mm -hmm. that it's not just like, okay, I'm sending it off to, uh, you know, Ember yeah. and it's going to come back next week and it's all back on the shelf. Like there's actually that follow up process that needs to happen to make sure um, is it is it readable? Is it playable? Is is the quality? Is the there sound for synced? Yeah, like yeah, that's one of the things. Especially if you're dealing with like the huge uncompressed one. video, which is so big, yeah. and sometimes it will just slow your computer down. You're not sure if it's just like, oh, is my computer just choking up this large file, <laughs> or is the file a problem? And then yeah. you'll try and figure mm -hmm. out how to troubleshoot the issues that you come up with. I mean, we didn't even have a computer when we started that was strong enough to handle, like, the files we needed. Oh, so exactly. we needed yeah, yeah, and that's we're, like, thing. a provincial government, so I know how you feel. And I was like, okay, we need something that's, that's really good with trust. a digital suite. Um, and, you know, and it was, like, again, a conversation about getting the funding with our IT people and saying, these are the files we want. And then they were like, oh, yeah, no, that computer, like, you can't we'll open explode. those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then working towards uh, getting us what we, we need for it. But, yeah, and, and the sound sync is the main yeah. one. Oh, that's, yeah, Like, that's the one where it, it happens. Um, and so it's always it's good to, consuming. yeah, it is. Like, the quality control takes a long time to do, yeah. but it's really important. I think we're, like, totally discouraging people from doing this now. <laughs> no, it's, you know, like, it's worth it doing. It it's, it it's worth doing. Like, you know, you're not going to not quality control yeah, anything that you get yeah. done. You know, you're going to make sure that everything control. spot check it. And, yeah. Right. And so what about the idea of if you have, say if you're using a, you know, a, a third-party vendor um, off-site to, to have your, um, your audiovisual, uh, you know, say tapes converted, um, what about things like, you know, if, if the sound quality is poor or it's a really grainy, you know, uh, quality, do you have them do those little sort of repairs and kind of tweaks or do you say, no, I just want a clean copy, the, the original version, you know, all of those little imperfections are part of that historic record, do you... Um, do you say, I just want a clean copy, or like, oh yeah, maybe you can like tweak with the color or play with the sound a little bit. Like, do you, do you give that option, or do you say, no, just a clean copy straight across? I think it depends what it is. Sorry. Um, no, no. You know, we normally don't like that. Okay. But, you know, we recognize that sometimes you've got someone out in the field who's done a recording and it's really, really scratchy or grainy yeah. or there's a lot of background noise. And so we usually get, we'll get two copies. We'll get one oh, okay. that's the this is how it played at the best yeah. settings and then we go all right clean it up and then they'll, yeah. they'll clean it up and then in the metadata that we make them provide us back about all of the recording and and how it worked is is um, 
we make sure that that's documented and on the copy and then when we like give it to somebody we let them know that you know this is has been cleaned up and and okay. that yeah yeah, so. we, we do, um, not through third party, because we do it yeah. ourselves, but we want to have one copy as close to the original as we can, okay. and then create, uh, then you can have another one, which you can make those modifications to if you feel it's necessary, and it depends on what the work is, because if it's an artist's work, then it really needs to be done in conjunction with the artist. The artist has to have some yeah, it can't be control you over that. But for it, like yeah. our Gable Vision project, um, one of the biggest failings um, in the original recordings was sound. So we ended up remastering all the sound, but we kept all those files separate. So we had the original, you know, kept the way it is, the uncompressed file, the way it was, uh, created audio files, then have stored those separately, right? Yeah. So we have the original saved, the master sound uh, files saved, and then we linked them up for um, public presentation because it just made it more accessible for people. Okay. And people tend to change the speed during the recording with the running out of tape and they're in the field. So we've come across that where, where you play it at, and then you're on one speed and then all of a sudden it gets slower, it speeds up because they've changed the speed depending yeah. on the tape length. So and right. so we, yeah. we go in and we make sure that that's corrected because that's no one can actually um, use those tapes. <laughs> <laughs> and then like, all of a sudden like talk and then we go over and people are like, did I do yeah, that it's, correctly? Yeah, it's, that's one thing that we find because we've got also um, what's like linguistics um, as well as um, early recordings of um, you know potlatches and songs and things that are very restricted but they were out in the field when they were getting permission to record these things and and so they would you know try and get as much on a tape as possible mm -hmm. so we find that sometimes they're they they're problematic with sound so it's great that we can clean them up uh, post digitization so okay any examples for you guys on that? Um, it would be pretty rare that we would have any cleanup okay. um, on anything after, like only if it would be unintelligible mm -hmm. um, in the case of audio. But otherwise, no, it's as close to the original as possible. Clean copies, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, sometimes we clean up our access copies, like take the color bars off mm -hmm. and just like maybe do a little bit of color correction. But our originals, our master copies, are just from the tape. And that being said, sometimes you can't get a like one pass won't get you a, mm -hmm. a file, so you might have to do it in a couple, like the heads might get so dirty that you'll have to stop it and then stitch the file together. Mm -hmm. In which case I just, you know, make a note in our metadata that goes with the file onto the LTO saying this was stitched together. And then, you know, another thing is like, there's kind of two ways of looking at it and, you, and I always want to get it as close to the original, but I also want the content and I also have so mm -hmm. much that I'm working through that sometimes when I'm going back and like doing a QC and I'm like, this isn't quite right, sometimes I'm just like, take a breath, you have the content, mm -hmm. it's fine. Like if there's another time when I can get back to it. Mm -hmm. So like don't discourage yourself by thinking it has to be perfect because it might not be. So if you're trying to do this work, it's important just to also, yeah, just it's like you're a human and you can only do so much with these things. And if you're getting the content and people can access it, then that's really great. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes yeah. you just want to not do the same tape four times in a row. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> where you can verbatim basically. Oh the my whole God. Tape. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Um, how are we doing for another so, question? Yeah, I have one question for uh, for Amber, um, and I, I think you might have addressed some of this already. Um, does the BC Archives currently have a digitization program for AV materials? And then, if so, what is the scale of the program, and what materials are being prioritized for reformatting? And I think that last one might actually be an interesting question of like, yeah. how do you prioritize? Yeah. Um, well, we do have digitization. Uh, we often grant funded so to help support other initiatives. Um, so I talked about the Webster. That was a grant funded. Um, what we're focusing on right now is um, our First Nations recordings and the what is what's traditionally called the linguistics department and then the ethnology department which is now the repatriation mm -hmm. uh, department and so we're working towards digitizing all of the recordings that we have so that's probably about just under 5,000 altogether linguistics as well as um, what were termed ethnology, which would often be stories and songs and potlatches, whereas the linguistics are vocabulary and sentence structure and that. And um, that's the priority um, because 
often the recordings were done in the 50s through to the 70s, some in the 80s, but then they, they made a lot of really good copies, so a working copy and then a, a divisional copy, but they also were created in the 70s, so they're, they're starting to, to be quite um, hard to get things off of. So that's the focus, and we're starting with the linguistic one because then we can help with um, language revitalization within communities and, um, and continuing on just working our way through them, yeah. And they're not gonna go online. Um, we recognize that, you know, there's a lot of rights and issues around those, but we wanna be able to um, get access to people faster than what we can, because of course everyone knows, like if it's an hour and a half of a recording, it's gonna take you two hours to actually transfer it. Um, so we try and do large batches and send them off, um, or do them in-house depending. Okay. Um, so yeah, that question about um, what kind of uh, format should people prioritize if they have in their collection? Because I think what happens, um, as much as you know, you sort of get overwhelmed by photographs in your collection just by the sheer volume. The, the issue with audiovisual things is you know you've got stacks and stacks and of, of film reels or the you know the banker's box is full of you know umatic tapes. You're like, I'm just gonna do that next week, and the next week turns into next year, and then five years later, ten years later, and you sort of compounded the problem. Um, what are some formats maybe that, from in your experience, you recognize that based on sort of when they were, you know, commonly used, now that we're in, you know, 2018, we really need to focus on this actual physical carrier because just the time difference, it's, it's falling apart, it's degrading, and the issue of, you know, equipment. <laughs> And supplies to make that equipment run doesn't ex is, is really hard to track down. So any recommendations? Half inch that? open reel is yeah, like yeah. the most critical yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 and pneumatic. Half inch open reel and pneumatic. Um, I find pneumatic yeah. is actually kind of robust as far yeah, as like, I, I oh, it's exciting. It's exciting. <laughs> ours is horrible. <laughs> You guys so are lucky. Where you work. Yeah. yeah, there well, are two answers. Well, and the thing is, you don't know where thing you know where yeah. things have been yeah. stored. Yeah. When we get things in, we have no idea where they've been stored or mm -hmm. what the garages and attics. And exactly, and so holes, you you yeah. will get things in and, and large tape collections and and also they change the slurry. Like if you have Sony tapes, then they're all mm -hmm. running yeah. great, mm -hmm. and then all of yeah. a sudden, yeah. halfway through their 1986 production, yeah. they've changed something in the slurry, and they just happen to be yeah. worse off, and some are better than others, and so that's what I. I, I find. I think for us, half inch open reel is a huge concern for us because we still have about 400 tapes that are not digitized that are half inch mm -hmm. open reel. And yeah. a lot of them are um, related to, like, they're in house productions. So they're documenting the history of our center. So those have to be prioritized. Um, and we were just talking earlier about the lack of uh, repair um, possibilities now. Um, you can't get heads for the material, mm -hmm. uh, for the decks. Um, so all that has become makes you have to look really sharply at your collection and say what are the what are the even the items we're going to prioritize prioritize the half inch open wheel yeah. possibly first and then what are those unique recordings that are going to have to be the ones that we're going to try to get. If we all knew we had a time machine to go back and start like stockpiling all this equipment years and years ago, then we well, we did. <laughs> yeah. Well, I but, think you guys are, are, are sort of because you're you're very focused on that. That is who you are and what you do. But, but I think for most small archives, like you know, the question is repair, repair and somewhere. maintenance for them is the problem. Yeah. So it's there's a lot of gear out there. Uh, yeah, we have we have twenty half inch decks at least at Vivo, but um, we need someone to repair them. Uh, okay. We have one. <laughs> so there you go, a call to like, you know, a professional... Which um, I don't think is working. <laughs> yeah, professional niche, repairing old audio equipment. It actually could be quite lucrative and someone really needs to take it up. Yeah. I think also yeah. what we do is when we're determining, we go, okay, from a preservation perspective, these are the worst and most obsolete. Yeah. Or, um, and then I bring in the archivist as well and I'm like, okay, well, what's not important? You know, like what in this set? Yeah, that's unfortunately, it, like well, dies natural death. or <laughs> if it because you're you're a lot of places um, so large as ours is you're sitting on a, a legacy of of mass collecting, mm -hmm. and and it may not meet the mandate. It may be elsewhere. It mm -hmm. it may not be documented, so you don't even know what's on that tape. And so, um, you know, I would bring them in and I'd say, this is what we have and this is what we know. And if there were copies somewhere, we we determine and. We had one set where we had a hundred things, and we got it down to 41. And the rest could actually be deaccessioned mm -hmm. because yeah. they didn't meet the mandate, or mm -hmm. transferred, yeah. or 
um, were just such a low priority. So we were able to really focus what we needed to do. So that's so, good, that idea of, of doing that appraisal and why it's really important mm -hmm. in this for this type of media because you don't want to be wasting your time and your resources on, on things that you're like, I've either, you know, copyright, you have no chance, there's, you know, there are national film board publications that, hey, I don't have to worry about those, that's their <laughs> responsibility, like all those little things can help you maybe take a really big overwhelming project down to something that's actually manageable that you can wrap your head around and not be so afraid to sort of to jump what about into storage the conditions? Yeah. Like, I, like you were wondering, mm. do you think that's ever an appraisal question? Because like sometimes if tapes are really bad, they'll damage the decks, right? And the decks mm -hmm. are almost more precious than the, because you need them. Well, so. we inspect every single thing before we even put it on yeah. on a deck. We yeah. just do this, the seven step check for anything that's in a cassette. Yeah. And if, you know, if we get the hint of, of mildew mold or mm -hmm. that lovely waxy crayon smell that speaks to, um, yeah. Uh, sticky shed, then it's like it's not goes to a lab, on. not going on the machine. Okay. Yeah, because we know that we don't have anyone that can uh, fix it if something were mm -hmm. happen, and we could destroy not only the machine but the tape. You know, you, you yeah. ruin the tape yeah, by exactly. just trying to play it, and then yeah. you're you're kind of. We have a bunch it. of tapes that were stored under the SFU swimming pool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> fantastic spot. Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we had the same problem with um, the Lenore Herb archive. She documented a lot of the punk scene in Vancouver, but she also stored all her tapes under a tarp on Hornby Island for a year and a half. So yeah. those are like not going near the decks yet. It's mm -hmm. a really big uh, assessment has to be done. Well, and that, that issue and that, that comment about, you know, where they've been preserved and even how you can then properly preserve them um, and with your own, your own storage conditions, it might even be a, a reason for people to say, like, thank you, but no thank you to donations. Because if you mm -hmm. know that you can't, even though it may be great, but if it's been sitting <laughs> on one of the Gulf Islands, you know, for two years out in the hum humidity, the high chance of those tapes being, you know, damaged to a degree that is mm -hmm. possibly irre irreversible that then could, if it's in a storage um, area with your other collection, mm -hmm. it could somehow migrate and affect other things. Like, you don't want to take that risk on. Um, there are some of the smaller organizations that I've, I've visited the site visits. They, they just don't want to deal with some of the older film or it's because they don't have the capacity. Like, we have no way to play it. We're not, you know, we have um, no way of even checking the condition of it. So for it to come in, it's just going to sit on the shelf and probably just die. Mm -hmm. And so is it better that we say thank you but no thank you at the front of the conversation with the donor and try to get them to maybe donate it to an organization that's better equipped to deal with it or has know that they can um, somewhere uh, in their work plan you know get funding or staff to, to manage it and so that's one way to look at it too not to say you know turn everything down but be realistic about maybe your storage conditions what you can actually maybe do yeah to help find a I good think home. that's important to do but I also think you have to look at your mandate um, in terms yeah. of um, media art history there are very few organizations or archives willing to take it on. Yeah. Um, so we're sort of preserving our own history. It's why we have that many tapes now is because there was no one willing to take that material yeah. at the time uh, while it was being produced. So we now have it. Um, with Lenore's work, we knew it was problematic, but um, one of the reasons it came to Vivo was uh, for reasons that are, are difficult to calculate, which was her family wanted it in an artist-run center. Hmm. They wanted yeah. it part of the movement she was part of. They wanted her to be considered an artist, yeah. right? They wanted that part of her legacy to be preserved. So for them, it was important. So there's also the, who's your community you're dealing with? Yeah. And, and with an artist-run center, we sort of have a different, um, uh, maybe a different level of need to respond to the artist directly, because that's our purpose for existing. Mm -hmm. No, excellent point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does our, our audience here have any questions? Put you guys on the spot. We're, we're filling their heads with wise bits of tidbits that are all. <laughs> um, online. I have a couple of questions from online. One email question that's asking for comments on digital formats for moving image film. So for example, uh, resolution like SD, HD, um, or for formats, um, DPX, AVI, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> you guys all know this, but share with sharing your information with the rest of us. So when you're when you're moving to these these more uh, modern converted formats, what are you guys using as your sort of your best practices for those? 
Um, the at standard? the city, our preservation format is FFV1 in a Matryoshka wrapper. It's an open source format. Um, it's currently going through the process of being standardized um, through a project called Cellar, um, spelled like Cellar, basement. like basement. Um, <laughs> well, you just don't want to store anyhow. your film. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, um, it's a fairly it's fairly young as formats go, um, and at the city we were. Um, almost like a guinea pig or like a very early adopter of that mm -hmm. format. We started using it, I think, I want to say 2011. Um, yeah, it's an open source format and it uses lossless compression, so you do get slightly, I mean, you do get smaller file size than you're going to get with uncompressed, um, but it's lossless, so you know you're not actually losing anything that way. Um, yeah, so that's what we use there um, use for, well. for preservation. Um, and we use that for both film, things that are film original and things that are video original, okay. but um, with film, things that are originally on film, it's newer that we've just started getting them digitized to file. Um, for quite a few years what we were actually doing was getting film sources copied to Digibeta mm -hmm. um, and video to this FFV1 Matryoshka when we were kind of trying that out. Mm -hmm. um, so now we've rolled over to doing um, film into that file format as well. Um, it's got really robust support and strong community behind it. Okay. Um, and it's been pretty widely adopted now, so that's what we're doing with that. But that meant that we also have all these Digibeta tapes. Like I think the last year we got film copied to Digibeta might have been, I want to say like 2014 maybe. It wasn't very long ago. So uh, a couple of years ago we actually sent in our Digibetas and got the content extracted off the digibetas so that we could make those things available as files. Yeah. Um, so that was just like another glitch. Um, in it's the all system. part of the learning curve. I mean, yeah, you know, absolutely. Reframe glitch into a positive way. Yeah. The learning curve and as technology well, improves in this area. And you know, and with video, um, especially video sources, I mean when I was um, a student in the um, dual program at Slace, it was really like maybe by time with a tape format like yeah. with digibeta mm -hmm. or copy it to another format um, because there isn't a trustworthy file format out there yet and there was this kind of like waiting for motion jpeg 2000 or like waiting for something that was supposed to be the thing yeah. um, because there wasn't an equivalent to say like tiff or wave or something like that yeah. um, so you know now at least like it's one of the things that i like to highlight as a positive of doing this work is that at least now there are, i would say like three choices um, that you could use for preservation formats. Great, and just for, um, for our audience out there that might not know of mm -hmm. all these three options, can you share them with yeah, us? Yeah, and this is for when you're digitizing um, analog video or film. So this isn't um, necessarily relevant to born digital or to things that came in like a DPX format or something like that. Um, that would pretty much be uncompressed in whatever kind of wrapper you like. Often it's MOV that people wrap in, but and all kinds of stuff. Um, and it would be FFV1 in a Matryoshka wrapper or Motion JPEG 2000 in whatever wrapper, mm -hmm. often MOV as well. Great. Yeah. We and use the Matryoshka as well. Okay. Yeah. We use the Uncompresso V210 codec in a .MOV wrapper. Um, and partly, I mean, I would like to move to something like FFV1, but um, as I said, with just me there two days a week and there's a steep learning curve, that's not really like a file you can just like play in quick time. It, mm -hmm. It's glitchy. Sometimes you have to play it through FFmpeg and know those kinds of terminal commands to be able to deal with these files. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it, it requires a bit more time. Mm -hmm. So that's, and we have the capacity to be saving the uncompressed files. So yeah. um, and we're that's doing what we've been doing. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, we've been um, saving the uncompressed MOV files at the BHEC on LTO because there's lots of mm -hmm. room for that. Um, but at SFU, I'm ingesting the I'm creating uncompressed files, yeah. but I've, I'm, um, the work plan is to ingest them into Archivematica. But we're kind of coming up across, uh, like against these processing space timeouts mm -hmm. that are happening oh, in Archivematica. Yeah. So yeah. I, we're also debating whether or not we ha we even can um, ingest. I can do it for like I think I can do it up to like a 45 minute video right now, but I can't do it over that. Like there's a mm -hmm. certain point where Archivematica just gives three. up and then <laughs> it, it times out and then I yeah. never see it right. again. So I don't know, I might have to and start ingesting compressed formats. I'm not sure, we're debating it. We're still doing tests, still trying to figure it out. It's not an easy thing. But I think that Archivematica requires like 10 times the amount of space 
to just process it to their like normalization yeah. and everything, which is a massive amount of space. It's mm -hmm. been hard for SFUIT to kind of build, like give to us, I guess. Have you thought about um, just transcoding it to FFV1 once you're done capture, like build it into that yeah, part of the workflow yeah. and then just upload and it rather than letting Manual normalization. Yeah. yeah, we have, and that's something that we're thinking about too. But I'm just not sure yet what. Yeah, we're thinking about it. Yeah, I have no no decisions yet. <laughs> well, so it's. I mean, so it's great. Like you said, like you know, even five ten years ago, people are sort of waiting for what that new format's going to be, and sort of some strides have been made to sort of here's a platform, it's working. We've had some good feedback. Um, I think in that sort of digital, um, in this new kind of environment, that's, that always is is going to be happening. Um, at some point there's just going to be a sort of, I want to say maybe an end to some of that older media coming in because we are going to sort of move to this fully digital world. Um, so maybe, yeah, there's the, that, that effort and that desire to want to keep these, these pieces that are going to become artifacts unto themselves, much less being archival records with the information they have on them. Um, we're sort of wrapping up in our last, um, our last minute. Um, I think an hour goes by very quickly, and you probably have so much more information to share. Um, but I want to thank you very much all for coming, and for Ember for coming over on probably a very early ferry this morning from Victoria, <laughs> so she gets the gold star for the day. Um, I think it's it, this is definitely one of those things where, um, you know, they might have talked about our, our panel today, uh, topics or, or terminology that you're not familiar with. But it's not to say don't be scared about looking into things or asking questions or reaching out to other organizations that are, are doing media conversion, especially with their audiovisual records. Um, there, there's no reason to sort of hide behind the, I don't know what to do. Um, I think the sort of the, the archival and museum community, um, we're a very welcoming bunch and you know people like to sort of share their successes and sort of bemoan our failures, but even from those failures and things that didn't work and 45 minutes later it times out on you and you're like, ah, you know. What do we do now? Like some of those those creative solutions that could come out of that process um, is, is part of sort of that learning curve for this whole process for, for moving forward. Um, I think uh, sort of wrapping things up. Um, thank you for all your information and sort of experiences you guys have shared today. Uh, thank you for those that that joined us today in person and for those following online. Um, if you have any questions, um, I am not an expert in this like these ladies are, but I can certainly, if you have any more questions, you can reach out to me and I can um, find information for you or put you in touch with someone if you have some more questions. Um, and with that, I think we will wrap up today. So again, thank you all very much and we will see you at our next webcast. Thanks.